How do we know, even from square one, that that person is not being bought off so that he gets a reduced sentence? And don't you think if we undertake death now in New York, you don't have death. You, you don't have death because they found the death penalty statute unconstitutional, but you don't have death because for three full days, citizens of New York came and testified about why it wasn't a good idea to bring death back here. But if you did have death in this state, just look at the burden we're putting on ourselves to get to the truth. We now are facing a situation in this country where we have 140 wrongfully convicted people who have gotten off a of death row, saved by college students like you in Innocence Project. 140 now and counting. There's another one about to come out in Louisiana who was wrongfully put there. And not simply because of DNA. DNA is only present in about one in every four homicides. You have to have biological evidence. It's mostly because of prosecutorial misconduct in some way. Hiding the exculpatory evidence or just or the original police report that showed to an original another suspect from the beginning, but we're gonna keep that tamped down because we're gonna go after our man here. All those kind of things. That they have such power, they control the evidence. There's so many ways it can go wrong. And it's not to say that most prosecutors are bad and they do this. But boy, we making a lot of mistakes and a lot of over 90% of those cases were prosecutorial misconduct. Well, I know nothing about all that. And I'm driving home and I'm trying to say, wow. And I, I never dreamed how well worn that road is gonna be between New Orleans and uh, Angola, which is an 18,000 acre prison it used to be three plantations worked by slaves in Angola. If you ever go to our prison and see these columns of men with hose over their uh, shoulders walking out to the field, 75% of whom are black, and they start pay at two and a half cents an hour working in the fields, you want to ask yourself how much has changed. They're all poor in the prison system, not just in Louisiana, but across this country. We. Uh, I was in California. In 28 years, they built 27 prisons in one university. That began to happen in our country. Well, so anyway, so then I began to visit both brothers. While I make the trip to the prison, I begin to see Eddie too and Pat. And then as a couple of months went by, <clears throat> I was waiting for them till they were ready to tell me what had happened, but I didn't want to be naive. So I went to the prison coalition office and I said, uh, could I just see some background information on the Sonia case? And they said, sure. And they pull out all these file folders. Now I've met Pat as a human being. I've met Eddie as a human being. And I opened up the file folder on the very top of the heap and there was a newspaper. There was the front page of it. There on the front page of it was a prom photo the parents had sent in of a boy, David LeBlanc, 17 years old, a young woman, Loretta Bork, 18 years old. And there was the terrible headline near their picture, teenagers found murdered. And it was over near Acad Acadiana, near Lafayette, New Iberia, St. Martinville, where Cajun people live. And there was a terrible story. And there it was, all written out, about how these two brothers, on this November night, these kids had gone to a homecoming football game at Catholic High. And they had gone to this little local lover's lane to park near an abandoned sugarcane field, and the two brothers were in the field. Five other couples came forward when David and Loretta were killed to say same thing had happened to them. They'd come up to the car, they'd tell the kids they were trespassing, they were the security guards, they'd have to take them to the owners, oh, well, and they see they have guns, they have flashlights, the kids are all alone. You can only imagine the terror. And then that would go, well, look, tell you what, if the girl has sex with us, we won't bring you to the, to the owners. What a despicable, unspeakable, that it happened to those kids. And this night, these two precious kids are found lying face down in that field. And they've both been shot in the back of the head. And the two people who did this 
I am spiritual advisor to, and it all comes down on me. Look what they did. One of the reasons the death penalty is tough for us, and me too, is because there's such outrage over the death of innocent young kids, their whole lives in front of them. Bang, 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 bang. They've both been shot three times, close range, in the back of the head, execution style. And these kids are dead forever, and it's every parent's worst nightmare, and I now read the story, and now I know what they did. First thing, other than, of course, the outrage, oh my God, innocent kids ripped out of life like this, was guilt. Like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm spiritual advisor to the two people who killed these innocent kids. And then I thought about the parents. And inside me, there was this nudge that said, you know, I ought to go see the parents. Everybody was Catholic. The Borgs who lost their daughter, the LeBlancs who lost their son, me. The Sonniers were Catholic, too. And I thought, I ought to go see them. And then I held back, and I went, mm, they're not going to want to see me. I'm the spiritual advisor of, kill, of the, the people who kill their kids. What if they say to me, sister, you're going to give spiritual counsel to the people? Our daughter didn't have anybody to spiritually counsel her in her last minutes of life before she was thrown into eternity. We don't want you here. We want justice. Will you sit with us on the front row when justice is done? We wish both of them had gotten a death penalty, but one is, and we're going to be there. Can't you say in all honesty you believe the people who did this should suffer with their own lives? They took the life of our child. And what would I say to them? And I stayed away. I did nothing. It was a terrible mistake. I didn't even write him a note to just say, I'm so sorry about your son, I'm so sorry about your daughter. Just express sorrow with them at their loss. Nothing, I did nothing. I met them at the worst possible time you could meet a victim's family because a week before Patrick was executed, there was a pardon board hearing, it's very public. It's probably the closest in modern times that you have of what used to go on in the Roman theater, an amphitheater where you put thumbs up if you want somebody to live or thumbs down if you want them to die. Because sometimes they have different colored chairs. You sign a book when you go into the pardon board hearing. What side you on? If you want to see the execution proceed, and that's all the victim's families pouring in there with all their friends because they've been promised. This is the justice that you can demand because that person took your child's life. And then the other side, do you want to ask the pardon board not to give the death sentence to the person to be executed? There were three of us asking the pardon board not to kill Patrick Sonia. And that was when I met the victim's family. And it couldn't have been more polarized. Which side are you on? And we were outside the front of the building while the pardon board was voting. And I had rounded a corner. They had rounded a corner. We ran into each other. The Borks, who had lost Loretta, their daughter, they were furious at me. And they maintained their dignity. They said nothing. They averted their gaze. They walked quickly past. Right behind them was the other couple. Uh, Lloyd LeBlanc and his wife, Eula. They had lost their 17-year-old son, David, and I later found out their family name died with David's death. They walked right up to me, and Lloyd LeBlanc, the father, said to me, Sister Helen, all this time you've been visiting with those two brothers, and you didn't once come see us. You can't believe the pressure we're under with the death penalty. Well, I didn't know what he meant by being under pressure. Doesn't it? every victim's family, if you're given the chance and you've had this loss and this is the justice, don't you want that justice? And I just said, oh, Mr. LeBlanc, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't think you'd want to see me. He goes, sister, you don't know what I think or how we feel till you come talk to us. I mean, later, when I was writing this book, my editor, when I did the first draft, I downplayed this. 
about not reaching out to the victim's family, and Jason, my editor, is looking at it, and he goes, well, Helen, that was a bad mistake. I mean, and I went, he said it was cowardice, wasn't it? I mean, you were scared, weren't you? I said, yeah. He said, look, when you write your book, don't just take people with you on the peaks of the waves when you do it all right. Take them in the troughs with you when you did it wrong. Wrong. And here's this man saying, sister, where have you been? I haven't had anybody to talk to and you can't believe the pressure. He extended his hand. He's the gracious one. He's the hero of this book. I'm going to tell you a story. Lloyd LeBlanc, son David, <coughs> killed that night by the two Sonia brothers. So he said, look, I pray in this little chapel. Come pray with me sometime. And sister, you need to come walk in our shoes. You need to know what we go through. And I went. And we knelt together in this little chapel in St. Martin of Tours Church in St. Martinville, Louisiana. That's the stuff of the Longfellow story of Evangeline and Gabriel. And under an oak tree is the young uh, Evangeline there, a statue of her waiting for her Gabriel. They got, you know, separated on the boats in the exile coming from Nova Scotia. And there's this old, old church there. And so he prays there. He keeps vigil. And I go to pray with him. And I'm kneeling alongside a man. And as we're praying, it's a Catholic Thing. We were saying the rosary, where you go through the mysteries of the life and death of Jesus and his mother. And it was on a Friday, which is in remembrance of the passion and agony and death of Jesus. And I'm kneeling alongside a man who's going through his son's agony and death. And the first clue I got that this was a special kind of man was when he prayed in the intentions and he not only prayed for his family and the book family and the safety of all teenagers, but he was praying for Pat and Eddie Sonier's mother who lived in the town and who couldn't go to the store because she'd overhear people saying loud enough for her to hear, there she is, that white trash woman is the mother of the two men that killed the book and the LeBlanc children. What's she doing in here? And she had become like a little hermit in the town, disconnected her phone, kept her blinds down. People were cutting up dead animals, throwing them on her front porch. Because you can't have this act of, where well, we're going to take him out, her sons out, with this act of deciding that they should die. But don't hate his mama now. Everybody be nice to his mama. You can't control legalized hatred, which is what it is. I mean, it's not exactly love to tell somebody we're going to take you out and kill you. You can call it justice. You can't call it love. 